is a, a booklet on male health, uh, studying psychological health for, for males, fathers, and sons. Oh my goodness. Uh, it, it is a study in seriously messed up thinking. Uh, and, and it outright blames masculinity for virtually all the woes of society. Uh, everything from spousal abuse to uh, so-called homophobia to uh, wars, you know, and virtually everything, every negative in society is the masculine, the fault of masculinity. So the APA's newest tact is to redefine masculinity. Yeah, well, they should have done that a long time ago, and not redefining it in terms of different attributes, but redefining it in terms of the biblical standard. So at any rate, boil it all down. For us as Christians, living in a world that's so utterly confused about male and female and genders, it is essential that we understand what actually constitutes male and female, masculine and feminine, when it comes to, to the biblical teaching. Uh, and what we will find when we look at what constitutes masculinity versus femininity in Scripture is, is something extremely different than what society uses to judge, judge masculine and feminine. Uh, we begin in Genesis. If you were really going to understand the pure form as God created male and female, you have to look back to the initial creation of man and woman. And in fact, the New Testament, Paul especially will do this in his writings as he references uh, various conduct issues in the church. He takes it right back to Genesis, right back to before the fall. So what I want to look at now is just what exactly can we say about masculine and feminine before the fall? How can we... what? What can we use to define it? How does God define it? How does God create it? And that's the true measure for what constitutes masculine and feminine, not any of these outward social markers. So first of all, let's note some things that become very important in our overall estimation of male and female. From Genesis 1, and we'll spend all our time in Genesis 1 and 2 this morning, and we'll go, we'll go more on this next week because I'm not going to have time to go through what I've got to go through here in 30 minutes. So Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. All right. Going through this passage, there are a number of things that actually will come in later in our discussion that we have to note immediately. For one thing, the fact that in this text, God presents himself as a plurality. Uh, that is, he is, his very name reflects plural, a plural form. So if you look on the handout, you're not going to read the, the uh, Hebrew, obviously, but you can at least see the form and see what I'm talking about. Uh, that is the Hebrew word Elohim. Now, in, in Hebrew, all of the kind of big-shaped letter things are consonants. All the little dots and dashes underneath them and above them, those are the vowels. Uh, so that, that word is actually pronounced Elohim. That word is the only name of God used in Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, it adds Yahweh, those four, Greek, or four uh, Hebrew letters in front of God. And, it, and it's Yahweh Elohim throughout chapter 2. But in chapter 1, it is strictly Elohim. It's used 32 times in chapter 1. It is a plural word. In the Hebrew language, all masculine plurals are formed with that little, it's, it's an im sound, and it looks like what you see there, a little, a little kind of L-shaped thing at the top by this big square thing. That's an em. And you read, by the way, right to left in, in uh, Hebrew, not left to right like you do in English. So you read right to left. So masculine plural ends with em, im. You see those two letters right at the end of the name of God, Elohim. So the very name of God is itself technically, linguistically, a masculine plural. 
So it's the equivalent of the S in English, where you slap an S on a word in order to make it a plural. So God's name itself bespeaks a plurality. Then he goes on to say, let us make in our image. Again, plural pronouns here. Here's a Luther's take on it. Uh, the, and by the way, let us make is one word in Hebrew. It's three words in English, one word in Hebrew. So the word, let us make, is aimed at making sure the mystery of our faith by which we believe that from eternity there is one God and that there are three separate persons in one Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So clearly, God presents himself as plural. Now, there are some scholars who try and argue that God is talking to angels. In fact, this is how the Jews try and get around this. Because the Jews, as you know, are, are strict monotheists. They don't believe in the trinity of God or plurality in the Godhead. So in order to get around this obvious reference to a plurality in the Godhead, they claim God is here talking to the angels. Let us make. Well, that would make angels co-creators with God. Us make. Uh, you know, which really goes against the whole of Scripture. So the only way to understand this is that God is talking to himself. And in some sense, that he is plural. Let us make in our image. All right? So we need to note this because this is important. When God makes man, he makes man in a plurality. Man and woman. He makes mankind to reflect his image. In the image of God, he made him. And it, and it repeats it. It uses several different you know, takes on that. Let's make uh, man in our image according to our likeness. It, it doubles it up. Uh, mankind takes on the image of God in, the, in, in virtue of the fact that we are designed to be a perfect plurality. Now, God's plurality, the three-in-one thing, is so utterly perfect and seamless that there is, there's complete and total harmony between them. Different, separate, yet one. Uh, it, it's a harmony above anything we have in human existence. Uh, somehow one and three at the same time. No division, complete and total unity. That's the way he made mankind in the beginning, man and woman. Complete and total harmony union, uh, and unity. The word man, let us make man. Here, obviously, in chapter 1 is being used uh, in a collective term. That is, man means mankind here. Even though the word that he uses technically is the word Adam, Adam. So the Hebrew word, it's just three little letters, and that little like T-shaped thing under it is, an, is a, 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 a short A sound. So it's Adam. And that's the word for man. That little word, uh, as it says there, can be either a singular, referring to a man, male, or it can be collective, referring to kind of mankind, which is how it's used here in Genesis 1.26. Let us make man is let us make mankind in our image. Because then 27, so God created man, same word, Adam, in his image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. So obviously here the context demands we understand this word is mankind or a collective term. All right, so God made man, God made Adam and Eve. Uh, through the first four chapters of Genesis, Adam is used 13 times to refer exclusively to a male human being. Uh, it is the same word used as a name for the first man, Adam. So that word actually has three different uses, depending on the context. It's either a male man, it's collective for all mankind, or it's a proper name for Adam himself. Actually, you know, poor Adam. I was watching a movie last night uh, where the dog didn't have a name. The guy said, what's your dog's name? He doesn't have a name. Just called him Dog. That's essentially Adam. Adam doesn't really have a name. His name is Man. A hey, man. The rest of his life, you know, Eve was always called him Man. Get over here. 
and it, it's, it's man. That's his name, Adam. That's all it means. And actually, worse than that, his name literally means dirt because the Hebrew word for dirt is Adam Ah with, a, with an Ah sound at the end of it. That's, that's dirt. So the, the whole taking Adam from, from the dust of the earth, from the ground and forming a human being, he takes Adam from the dirt and then names him Dirt. <laughs> so Adam goes through life with a name constantly reminding him of his origins. He came from the earth. So he is Mr. Earth, Adam, a word which now attaches itself to all of humanity, to where in the eyes of God we are all dirt. We are all Adam. We are all mankind. So anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating word. Um, in Genesis 5, it's by verse 2, it makes very explicit here that God names. It's not just kind of accidental that we're calling mankind man. In 5 verse 2, he specifically names the man and the woman together man. Adam. So he created them male and female, blessed them, and called them Adam in the day that they were created. Now, the fact that the word man is used to represent both man and woman is more than a linguistic curiosity. It bespeaks God's design that man individually is to, in some sense, represent the whole. So it is an element of his design that Adam constantly fails to, to express. It's... Genesis 1 and 2 are full of these little hints about the true nature of what it means to be a man. And what it meant for Adam to be a man, first off, the first thing is to represent. Man is, Adam is to represent his family. He is even, his family is even called by him, his name. Mankind, Adam kind. Adam is the one who's supposed to represent. He's the one who's supposed to stand up uh, and, you know, take responsibility. That, the, the representation thing and responsibility go hand in hand. So an essential mark of masculinity is this concept of representation. Uh, the, the concept that he is supposed to be the one who steps up and takes responsibility for the whole. All right. Um, skip a next bit there, because I mean it's it's interesting, but more so to the pastors. Uh, Adam's isolation, page two. This goes to the issue again of the idea that man is created to be a relational being. We see it in the name, man for mankind. That is, he represents a whole. God created maleness, too, especially, to be co corporate, communal. God did not make man to be an isolated thing unto himself. And there's this curious little event that happens that kind of drives home the importance of this in the overall design of man himself. And that, that is God allowing man this period of isolation and self-discovery, if you will. So if you look in Genesis 2.18, God said it is not good that the man should be alone. Okay, so first of all, God notes the fact that his aloneness before the creation of Eve isn't good. It's the first time God has said anything about something not being good. Everything up to now, he created you know, uh, light and dark and it was good. He created light and it was good. Everything is good. Now he gets to this idea of man being isolated. It's not good. First time that something like that is said. I'll make a helper comparable to him. All right? So God sets up his mind even though you know, this, this is undoubtedly in God's mind from the very beginning because he's already made all of the animals in this binary form, male and female. So of course he's going to make man the same. So this has always been God's plan, but here he now voices it out loud 
He's going to make a helper comparable. And we'll come back to that in a bit. Now, 19, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. Just like he made man. He made Adam out of the ground. He makes the animals out of the ground, too. That's not unique in the creation of mankind. What is unique is the fact that God breathed into man his spirit, something he did not do for the animals. So he formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and then brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever name, or whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So God allows Adam this period of self-discovery. He notes the binary nature of all of creation. And then this, this kind of hauntingly lonely statement, but there was not, a, not one found comparable to him. No idea. Now the text does, don't give us any hints at that. Um, it, you know, I mean, the, the implication seems to be it was fairly soon, but there's really nothing that says for sure. It undoubtedly would have taken a while to file all the animals past him to have him name them. You know, that could have taken weeks or months in and of itself. But he wants Adam to see the union of male and female in everything he created and then recognize in himself something wanting, something lacking. So the question is, why? Why was this period of self-discovery important for Adam so that God really orchestrates this entire thing to happen so that Adam could figure this out on him for, his, for himself? Why is that so important? Right. He, men and women are going to be very different. Adam gets the opportunity to see in the animal kingdom that, that male and female are different, both in characteristics and in outward form. So he learns to appreciate something about unity in difference. Now, that, that first thing we noted, the very idea of the image of God, one of the essential elements of the image of God is unity and plurality. Trinity, three in one. A God who is more than one and yet one simultaneously. In perfect harmony and unity in every sense. Uh, God intended his creation of mankind when he gives mankind the image of God, again, to be a unity and plurality. Not in the same sense as the Trinity, certainly, but nonetheless somehow reflecting his image. <coughs> So Adam has this period of self-discovery where maybe he's learning something of the image of God. The unity in plurality, the, the, the different but same, the harmonious, uh, harmoniousness of, of different beings and yet one. And that this is his plan for him so that Adam appreciates it when it happens to him and doesn't kind of look at Eve and go, why is she so different, you know? He's supposed to understand this as a unity, a harmony, a, 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 a koinonia, togetherness, a, com, a communion in a way. All right, uh, implications on the handout here, implications of male and female as the image of God for sexual ethics too. If male and female together point to the image of God, what happens to God's image when maleness and femaleness are corrupted? This is where I think the devil's attacks right now in our day and age are, are, are deviously brilliant. How do you turn people away from God? How do you confuse the world about God? That's the devil's number one aim. Well, you know, you can attack the tri triune God of Christianity and try and substitute idols, which he certainly does a good job at. But what if you just plain totally confused people about male and female. If they're supposed to bear the image of God and in this, the unity between maleness and femaleness, you see something of God, 
what if we so messed up the very idea of male and female that we lose any semblance of what God is all about? Because God is Father. So what if we totally mess up the idea of what fatherhood is? So you don't know the difference between fatherhood and motherhood. Uh, God is Son. What if we so messed up the concept of sonship that there's really no difference between a son and a daughter and everything is all the same? The, by, by destroying the very concept of gender difference, the devil is able to totally blind this world to the very nature of God himself, who is father, who is son, who is different and yet unified. I, I, think, I think it's utterly brilliant. I think it's genius in a horribly evil way. Uh, as a means of finally getting at God. And, and when we do get around to looking at the temptation next week, hopefully, you see the temptation of Eve is really an attack on the image of God. Why does he go to Eve and not Adam? Wasn't the first element of masculinity that we've noted that God gave Adam the idea of representation? That he was supposed to represent the whole? Why does the devil go to, to Eve? He's attacking male and female right there. He's trying to, to mess with the order God's created. No. Sure. You can attack the image of God in school. You can't uphold the image of God in school. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. A little bit more. Creation of woman. Now, unfortunately, Genesis 1 and 2 are a bit sparse on defining femininity. The reason being that Eve is essentially created very quickly right before the fall in terms of the biblical account. We really don't have a lot of, of, on Eve. It's precious little. So what we can get about femininity, we have to draw from fairly sparse comments like when God created her or, or makes up his mind to create her like we read in Genesis 2.18 I will make him a helper comparable to him. So a nature of Eve as woman, an essential mark of her femininity is to be a helper comparable to Adam. Alright, uh, let's look at some words. Uh, the Hebrew word for help, a helper. Uh, BDB, by the way, is an abbreviation for the Hebrew standard scholarly lexicon, which is called Brown Driver Briggs. So their definition of the word is help, succor, one who helps. You know, it's a pretty, not a very uh, complicated word. Just somebody who helps. Um, comparable to him. Uh, the word in Hebrew is neged. Defi de de defined by Brown Driver Briggs as what is conspicuous or in front of, according to what is in front of, corresponding to. So God made a helper according to what was in front of him. Like Adam, but a helper. Now this idea of being a helper. Eve was created as a helper. Helper in and of itself does not define authority or importance. It is also a description of God's role with humanity. God takes on the role of helper. In the Old Testament, God is called the helper of people. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is called the helper. So it's actually part of that image of God again. God is helper according to his nature. So he implants in Eve this unique characteristic of his own, his own image. She bears the image of God in being a helper. Uh, The one being helped is still ultimately the one that bears responsibility for the object of the help. That is, God is our helper, but we are ultimately judged on how we've received the help. Have we accepted it or rejected it? 
a father can help his son with his homework, so a father can have more authority than the son, but the son still is the one who bears the grade. So in that Adam is the one being helped, he is still the one who has to bear responsibility for the whole. Again, a masculine trait. And this, we'll see this over and over again in Genesis 1. The number one trait of masculinity, the thing God put into the male gender to define that gender, is this idea of responsibility for another. He bears responsibility for it. Yeah. He failed bearing the image of God, which was responsibility for. He stood there and watched Eve wreck humanity and didn't do a thing about it. So yes, he violates the very nature of the masculinity God places within him. The fall is all about violating gender in a way. Because gender, as God defines it in the masculine, is to be responsible for. Eve is a helper. That does not make her less important any more than God as our helper is somehow less important than us. It simply means Adam is the one who bears responsibility. So that's his number one goal. And her goal, number one goal, first created goal, is to support him in that. That's why she was created. So when it all, oh my gosh, we're out of time. When it all goes to pot after the fall, God goes to Adam. What, if, what is this? Why? Because he's the one created from the beginning to bear responsibility for it. He's the representative. It all comes together really pretty marvelously. All right, we'll come back there and pick it up there next time. Let's close. Gracious Father, we thank you for the blessings that you have given us in making us male and female. We pray that you help us understand who you have made us and how we can express you in our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen.